Over at the uh, Bayangnya Timbul Tenggelam uh, exhibition, one corner of the uh, exhibition that we have here is sort of a mock-up studio on how it was like or how it looked like in 1950s. So within this studio space, of course, it doesn't have a 100% copy of a certain studio, but we propped it up uh, with enough materials, enough tools, accessories, the cameras, the, the, the lightings, just uh, as how it was used in 1950s. Of course, accurately, it's much, it's much more earlier. Uh, some of it are arriving from 1930s and 1940s as well. But uh, majority of the time, it's much more systemized or systematically uh, organized, I suppose, in 1950s after the Japanese left. So what we see here is, uh, of course, we didn't include the dark room. Uh, is the actual studio space. This is where it is expected what one would see uh, when one walks into the studio. And uh, what we have here is uh, in the area where a person would do their makeup at one end and then you have the backdrops. Either they can choose the scene. Some of the studio contain only one scene, most of it. But in, in some general cases, they have two scenes. So we have the uh, one of it is more on the outside and another is uh, more of an indoor. Now, over, over right at the corner there, you would see a table for photo assistants to do their, their touch up. And then certainly the, uh, the leading photographer's table in which where he decides what uh, can be considered um, vetted through the images where it's finalized, endorsed and sealed. And then, uh, of course, right away, what we see here is uh, the camera itself. If you move in a bit more closer. All right. What we have here is the... Uh, let me see. Don't worry, I'll put everything back in. Is the uh, Shanghai Seagull uh, studio camera, which produced in, um, uh, in China. It's a wonderful, beautiful piece of camera. That is, um, uh, that is, uh, I would say, a staple sort of a, a studio uh, camera that is being that is being utilized in the past. Reason being is there are several shops around in Kuala Lumpur that I had uh, managed to ascertain and locate. Uh, I've traveled around in the peninsula Malaysia and also uh, another collector also travel travel in Sabah, finding the exact same camera that is being utilized in Malaya. That is in 1950s. This is the Shanghai Seagull camera and is very, very much uh, very sturdy, solid, mobilized. And I've observed at least 14 cameras here in Malaysia. That is still can be located in various conditions. So uh, this is one of the most pristine condition I've seen as yet from one of our private collectors. And he borrowed us for this exhibition to actually um, somewhat to emulate the entire studio. So this is the heart of uh, any studio, the camera itself. So this camera is uh, highly customizable uh, and definitely much, in my personal opinion, is much more better than the, its Japanese counterpart, which is the Astoria camera, which is another type of camera that is also commonly found in Malaya and also in Indonesia as well. But this one is highly customizable. The, uh, the metal workings are very, very much good and is solid and sturdy. And then the woodworking is just like using a hard timber right around it. And the rest are cast iron as well. So if I could somehow, I mean, I'll do this back after this. <laughs> okay, so let's see. So if I close this one back, you would Commonly, you have what we call it as the dark cloth, so that one uh, will be able to actually focus and actually start seeing what the images brings about. I mean, right in front of us is a, a rendered manner in how studio settings would be. And you can see right here, this is where the, uh, the ground glass would be at, and this is where the photographer is going to focus on their sitters. Now, if we move towards the studio area itself. Now, here's an interesting bit. Commonly, they use like three lightings. One is a key light, another one is a fill light, another one is a hair light. Usually, they use a combination of three lightings, but not two. 
and then you have like props right here. Now the props that you see here is like commonly the uh, the main sitter is going to be here, and then you have a reflective mirror. Ladies, actually, Chinese ladies always have this preconcept as a as a holistic. I mean, like you can see the front, but you can also see the back portion of it once the sitter sits in, and then you can see the back portion. That means the person is whole, the person is real, the person is exist. So it's um, an interesting concept uh, that arrived from the, uh, I believe, from Chinese painting and some uh, articles, I think Claire Roberts. Uh, and another uh, academic writer or scholar writer wrote extensively about how the props were utilized, what is expected within a studio space. Now, everything counts, everything matters. I mean, even the plants itself, the plants, uh, it's, it, uh, it means or represents longevity or the flourish of life and sometimes some uh, mannerism of joke. Uh, there were some images of an elder man who sits down with a lot of pots of dead plants on his, underneath his feet and then one living plant means he outlived many lives or he has many many good fortunes of life so that's one portion and then you have right here what we call it as the spittin uh, spittin uh, it reflects of a person's having um, having servants taking care of their bodily fluid waste spits and whatnot and they have servants taking care of it and pets as well you have sometimes you have cats you have dogs commonly uh, and what you have right here, this one is out of rarity, a pug. And uh, you have swan and other miscellany type of porcelain animals. Now animals, the reason why it's in porcelain, because animals never s stand still. They are very uh, agitated, <laughs> I suppose, whenever they are in the studio. The lightings can be harsh as well. So they never manage to keep them calm or keep them in place. So instead, they have a representation of animals. So as for all this paraphernalia of toys, not toys, but actually right for children. So you have like over here, like an iron cast uh, horse, and you have also a car, a tricycle, and also a Vespa right around the corner itself. A selection for what is preferred, uh, sort of um, something to entertain a child to be part of the uh, photo studio process. Um, right at the corner here, okay, you have the photo studio's assistant where they do their hand tinting or retouching. They have enough tools, they have enough mediums. Usually what we have right here would be like the, uh, they use martial oil color. Sometimes they use a regular watercolor painting as well or even like some of this, what we call it as a watercolor pad. Uh, this is uh, commonly found in the past as well. This is like a segment where you just take a bit of water then you just like dab onto it and just you can transfer it in back forth. Sort of a dry version of watercolor. So then they do the hand tinting and then they later on they pass it to the uh, desk for sort of a seal of approval that then the, uh, the photo assistant did a good job at it. Right. Uh, let's see. Okay, let's move on to the... Uh, I guess a leading photographer's table. Now, it can be all sorts of things on the leading photographer's table. It can be a whole bunch of things or a whole bunch of like really nice pristine uh, table, which is unusual. So also the leading photographer, sometimes they have uh, another, what we call here is a retouching uh, stand or retouching table uh, in which the assistant have one as well. So over here, you, that's where the, uh, the leading photographer tends to do the final retouching or whether the assistant have to redo it again and so forth. So then once it's done, then usually once it's endorsed, let's say this is just a simulation of it, the leading photographer is going to stamp it with their company seal uh, and it's, uh, eventually it's going to be passed to the clientele. So you have like commonly you have the radio for entertainment pur purposes, a bit of lighting as well. Right here you can see the retouching table lamp. And of course, nonetheless, we have, they do smoke quite a bit. <laughs> so people in the past, they do smoke quite a bit, which is usually the uh, Craven cigarette, I think. 
uh, exactly as how it was in, uh, in the past. So yeah, um, that's the main studio. So what we see here, it lives in uh, what is expected in the past. It is more what we call it as an event of life. Uh, once the sisters, the sitters come into a photo studio, it, has, it is more of an event. They are wearing their best uh, suit or their best dresses, do up their hair nicely, try to calm their children to be on their best behavior. And it is a very important uh, point in their life as well to be part of this sort of a system of um, uh, what we call it, the, uh, where they are photographing, not as how it's being done nowadays. Nowadays it's more like a slice of life. But in the past, it's a, it is an event. It is a celebration. Uh, to do a photo session, it is an actually uh, more like a, it can be a ritual thing as well. We had observed some of the images in the past where even they do on annual basis, birthdays and whatnot. But statistically, uh, the common photographs that you see that's been done up is mainly by uh, the Chinese. There are four stages in life in which they do their photo session. The first will be their birth. Usually you tend to see uh, photographic images of the child or baby or infants. And then you see them in their adulthood, which is the second stage, uh, them at the peak of their youth, a uh, successful point, uh, commonly when they have a good uh, career path or career or job. And then the third one would be like uh, when they are reaching um, at the elderly stage, them with a really large set of family, uh, with their grandchildren and so forth. And then the final stage, which is death, uh, where they have a single portrait on themselves at their best representation or the best manner or the best look that they can find uh, to be permanently uh, a way to be remembered. So that's why sometimes you see big images that you can see up there as well. It's how, um, how they, they are being, um, I guess, represented. Uh, I know sometimes some people say, is it just this a bit claustrophobic? Well, photo studios tend to do that. The only place where it is reasonably spacious uh, would be, uh, well, where the sitters would be at. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. Sometimes you have to distract the child. They have like a tiny bit of a whistles or toys. Sometimes they have a rattler as well uh, to distract the child so that they can actually uh, start seeing um, how, well, where they need to focus towards the photographic lens. I do love how the dressing tables we had to uh, source through quite a number of uh, tools and make up the hair brushes, the hats, some of it are a bit of uh, more towards trending fashion all the time. And then uh, the way I look at it, it's, um, oh yeah, I did say it's, it's more like an like a event of their life, but sometimes it's just living a fantasy as well. That's why you see images of indoor uh, places that is, in a way, luxury, and then you have outdoor as well. Sometimes it's on an exotic location next to the beach. Some of it, if uh, even um, uh, in the Middle East, the pyramids that we saw, some sort of scenic or waterfall, or even like in, uh, in different countries. So it's an imagination, uh, even a displacement uh, away from where it is. And of course, uh, besides the camera, besides most of the tools, the lightings, there's also a uh, light stand that is from the uh, same company as well, from the Shanghai, uh, Shanghai Camera Manufacturing, and the carpet. The carpet is one of the most expensive thing, I, th I believe, uh, to be part of the studio. Once you have that, it means that you really have a sort of an elevated platform for them to be in. Not everyone have a nice sort of rug to be uh, furnishing as well. And then some of the images you see in the gallery, uh, they do bring out the carpet and because of the lighting situation is never ideal. So they emulate the outdoor, like an indoor uh, kind of representation version where they have drapes, 
on the side they have the carpet they have some furniture as well so that's where i think it's kind of interesting how photography takes shape uh, and photography had uh, a way on reimagining self so it's it's exactly that it's like a, a, a an event and uh, I believe I, I recall I had a conversation with uh, one group photographer I mean like the camera itself it's so big last time like, I mean like this is reasonable size it's like an entity in the room as well it's just like a, another person that is within the space observing and and how one behaves in front of it so it does that i mean like camera no matter what shapes and size it does that to people that's where we actually change our manner change our behavior once we notice like the lens is on to us so yeah i hope that covers an uh, a good amount of introduction towards this space uh, thank you so over in malaya there are tiny bits of uh, it almost copies like the European counterpart but there are tiny bits of drops of uh, sort of a cultural material cultural objects as well I mean not all have the same props as one would say in most of the 1960s 1970s it starts to take shape of the Malayan sort of look in the photo images such as example the, the chairs uh, wrought iron sama bamboo as well they take the shape of a uh, pucuk paku or the uh, one of our common ulam or plants so it's the props within it uh, as an indicator as well towards the uh, the origin yeah this is very much a malayan photo studio this is very much uh, the uh, images from thailand early photo studio where else in indonesia is a mix of a whole lot of things so we do take uh, heavily from the european part it copies in the same mannerism i believe the reason being is as well uh, the, the amount of space needed and the, uh, the methods or the methodology on how the images was made once it's been captured on the camera is they quickly move to the dark room and then once it's being processed the image are, the negatives being made is being printed and then it's being uh, later on processed within almost in the same space as well um, and where you can see it so that's how uh, the decision on making of this is somewhat in 1950s where the transition in between the 1930s and before our Malayan sort of look start to take shape. This is where the transition starts pushing in. We start uh, picking certain materials that starts to be our own sort of visual identity. You have the hand thing. It's being done over at what we call it as the retouching stand. Um, over at this wall, you would see a series of hand tinting and of course some of it is being spread across a gallery as well. Now photographers um, or early photo studios, uh, one of the selling points would be hand colouring. Uh, images of the past has its limitation to be silver gelatin prints, sometimes it's bromide prints and it can only manifest in black and white. So, but some of them won't say, oh, let's have a bit of color to it because uh, it li f photography lives as what we call it as miniaturized uh, portraits. So some of it well, almost life size, but uh, as some of our findings, but they want it to be colored as close as possible or as ideal as possible to the living person. So out of rarity they they ra rarely employ much of an apprentice because of course certain financial restriction so they have their better half or the photographer's wife tends to step up into the role to do the uh, either the processing the printing and certainly but they leave it in their good taste as well to do hand tinting uh, hand tinting is not like coloring okay it's not like a hand coloring it's what hand tinting does, it elevates, uh, it, it eases into the image rather than us, than splat, here's the color of the skin, here's the color of the clothes. No, uh, like some of it that you can see down here, these are our three significant works by the early photo studios. It eases in into the, uh, and actually 
it amplifies to be uh, the, nat the natural beauty of the, uh, the subject matter or the sitter. So now recently I, I'm saying that I'm seeing that a lot of uh, hand tinters in early photo studio because when I travel to the early photo studios, uh, I always interview the, the grandkids of the photo studio owners and they keep on saying that their grandmas or their grandmothers or their mother, some of the elderly, are the ones who's doing the hand tinting. Uh, one significant story I remember uh, traveling to one of early photo studios, if I believe to be in Pahang. Um, where was it in Pahang? I, I have to relocate back. Um, there was this old Chinese lady who I believe to be or have this sort of quality of hand tinting. Uh, and I interviewed her. She and I met up with her four times. And out of the four times that I met with her, she gave me three, uh, four different narratives about her background and four different names as well. So I asked the daughter, why is it the case? And it's like, why is it that I'm hearing different stories? And it's like, it's the same lady that I meet. And the daughter mentioned, well, she's afraid of the, uh, the law because I think, be uh, I be led to believe because, uh, I mean, like, she has this uh, out of traumatized feeling that the, uh, the enforcement are going to go after her because maybe she has some sort of relation with the communists uh, during the time which I, I told her that, that I'm not part of any law enforcement but I have a, a, a serious interest to understand uh, what was it like the culture of uh, early photo, photo studios in Malaya. So majority uh, of uh, my encounter in the photo studios was majority of the ladies were doing the hand tinting process and I truly believe like, um, they were highly skilled people and this are, most of them are self-taught. Some of them go under apprenticeship, they learn from other painters, they learn from other studios. Um, but to those, in terms of qualities, uh, some are still at the learning stage, as you can see. I mean, like some of them are really forcefully coloured rather than easing in, like the one that we see over there, they are really painted over. So, yeah, we, it depends on the ideal state of uh, hand tinting, on to what degree the sitters or their clients are expecting out of it. So there we go. I mean, like we have as well, like some of the jewellery is the gold. And then we have also some of the, uh, uh, some of them really emphasize, I think, over this one is the gold teeth, I think. Yep. They're hand tinting the gold teeth on the jewellery just to remark that I'm rich, I'm wealthy, I can afford to, uh, to put gold into my, uh, my dentures. <laughs>